the uh, problem with uh, safety procedures in public transit has been gone, going on since the coronavirus was uh, detected in our country. I think it was as far back as March, uh, no later than April, but I think it was March that the chairman Glenn's and others, uh, including, of course, myself, started writing the airlines and the administration urging a, a mask requirement. The first couple of flights I went on in March, there was not only no mask requirement of the flight attendants, but they were talking right in our faces and they were talking without any regard for masks. And there were people doing the same. The airlines finally kind of came around, but the Trump administration never did. And I commend President Biden and our new administration for putting this mandate in place. It's necessary for the protection of the public. When I got on my flight to come home after the insurrection at the Capitol on the 6th of January, I heard people uh, getting on the plane when offered uh, tissue to, for protection uh, say, take it, put it back in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, back in the, in, in, in the uh, plate that it came out of and say, COVID hoax. I heard people walking down the aisle going, I guess we need to be six feet apart or we'll get in trouble. And none of the people who had Trump material on wore masks in the waiting area. So I don't know who can answer for the airports, but I know Ms. Nelson can answer for the flight attendants. Can you give me some examples of problems that the flight attendants have had people who refuse to wear masks refuse to uh, accept, they have to accept or remarks about the tissue, the, 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 the cleansing, and, uh, and and any, tell us about the airport. I was shocked at DNA. They made an announcement that you're supposed to wear a mask in the waiting area, but nobody got up and said a word to anybody. I could not find a seat in the waiting area without being next to somebody who was exposed to coronavirus. Ms. Nelson, if you could respond, and I appreciate your efforts and your work, and everything Rodney Davis said, I say double. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Cohen. Um, <clears throat> the the days uh, immediately preceding the insurrection and right after were some of the most scary times that we have ever experienced in aviation. Uh, this was a new safety and security threat that we uh, have never experienced. And uh, typically when someone is acting out in an airport, swearing at other people, uh, refusing to comply with rules, acting belligerent and even delusional, uh, they are denied uh, the freedom of flight. Uh, we were very clear that anyone who attacked our nation's capital um, and our democracy uh, should be denied the freedom of flight. And uh, we were right because what we saw uh, in the airports was we were not really prepared to deal with this. It was oh, This was a, a, a bit of a mob mentality that took over. Um, we are trained to de-escalate. We're actually trained to ask other passengers to help us contain any problems if we're not able to peacefully de-escalate the, the problem. But when there are so many people acting out, uh, we didn't have the training or the resources to deal with this on our planes and everyone was at risk. We had a situation um, on one flight. Uh, I, there are many, many stories, but where the flight attendants called the pilots, um, begged them not to open the door because they were fearful of uh, people uh, entering the cockpit and taking over. Um, we had uh, people who were yelling at other passengers, uh, pa a group of passengers um, berating a black woman and her baby uh, on the plane. Um, and people who were not complying. And the, the mask policies were a big part of this. Enforcing the mask policies did two things. One, um, we, we understood that there was a concerted effort not to wear these masks, believe that this is part of the, um, believe that this is uh, part of the political effort to push back. People thought this was about their personal liberties. Um, I would relate this to the smoking ban uh, when people said that they wouldn't be able to last for five minutes without a cigarette. They didn't get to have exemptions because it was going to put the rest of us at risk. So we had to very, very quickly clamp down on these mask policies. We were just not prepared for what we experienced in our airports. I'm sorry that you went through that. Uh, the crews that I represent went through Sarah, very I'm scary about, times on board. I'm about out of time. I'd like to get one other issue in for you. Go ahead. To respond to, and that's the middle seat issue. Uh, it's very discomforting to sit next to somebody in a, um, in, in the what you used to call tourist. I guess I don't. It's seat. Let's call it steerage. Uh, to sit next to somebody who doesn't wear a mask. 
should the airlines not keep those seats open regardless of cost? Well, first and foremost, everyone must wear a mask, and you're absolutely right. Uh, secondly, uh, we can't properly socially distance on a plane, so while a middle seat provides some additional comfort, and as Chairman DeFazio noted, um, controlling the how many people are on board will help uh, with the number of people who are spreading the virus. But what some of the airlines have done instead of in, uh, blocking the middle seats is they have put more airplanes up in the air so that the load factors are lower overall. You're not really experiencing that on the flights to DC because oftentimes those are the ones that are uh, the highest capacity, highest demand. Um, but uh, there is more capacity in the airline industry that hopefully will give us some room to work with there. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Mr. Cohen, your time has expired.